Hi everyone, thank you all for coming here. Uh, my name is Amanda, and this is the place where you can find me on the internet. Um, I'm from Brazil, and this is the first talk I'm giving in English, so I'm a little bit nervous. But funny thing is, every time I say I'm from Brazil, people think I'm from Rio, which is nice, I like Rio, but I'm from Sao Paulo, which is a city that looks like more like this, with a lot of traffic, but we do have great food there. And also, Platform Attack Office is there. It is the company I work for. And also, Source Level, which is a company created by Platform Attack that do code review and team metrics. Um, and what I want to talk about today is about a bunch of lessons I've learned when I was learning Elixir and things I've asked myself and things other developers asked myself as well. Because at Platform Attack, we have this culture of hire and training developers, and a lot of folks moved from object-oriented to functional, and they kind of had the same questions I had when I was changing. So it may help you. And one of the things that people ask me the most is how was it to change language? And normally, Elixir is not the first language we learn. Uh, most people come from object-oriented languages, and when that is the case, there are some questions. We have things such as, where do I start? Uh, how do I organize things now? I don't have objects anymore here. I can have state in objects anymore. So is this code I'm looking at really complex, or is it me that doesn't know functional programming enough? And, you know, <laughs> first month can be harder. And there will be a lot of questions, but things such as, am I writing object-oriented in functional programming? Am I writing Python in Elixir? And it is a lot of new stuff to take in one time, a new project, a new language, a new paradigm. And I think it's important to say that even though anxiety may hit harder, things get better over time, and then, OK, you started your new project, and there's a lot of things to know. So one of the things is, how do we use the language tooling in our favor? So Elixir has a bunch of cool stuff that help us in our journey. And chances are, you are dealing with databases in your project. And one of the things that may be different from other languages is how you do with it. So there's this lib in Elixir that's called Ecto. It's a lib to map and validate data and access databases. And in object-oriented language, we have our AMs. And they are great and solve many problems we used to have when we were dealing with procedures. But they are also more implicit in the way they control our queries. And implicit can be dangerous sometimes. In Ecto, on the other hand, it's explicit. So this is a big change in the way we think. You have to take mo most of the decisions dealing with databases now. So instead of accessing data using objects, you now need to use repo. And why do I need to write more code to get things done now, right? So it may be harder at the beginning, and now we write things more like SQL. So we can't access the databases through objects anymore, and we have to make those decisions we didn't have to make before. And an example for, the, for this is preloads. Uh, now you have to think if you are going to need to access an association from uh, some, for example, let's think about a domain of a course that has a bunch of users, and you need to access those users' collections 
in somewhere in your application. You need to think about this when you're doing your query, because if you don't, you will receive an error. And this kind of stuff didn't happen before, right? So now, if you want to do a query that, that brings the course and the users, you need to preload this association. And this tells Ecto that it will be necessary to bring the courses alongside the course. Oh, sorry. It will be necessary to bring the users alongside the course. So by being explicit about this, we just prevented a possible n plus 1 scenario. So instead of executing a lot of query users, we now have something like this, which is better for our databases, right? And one of the things that is important is to spend time learning all the cool features Ecto has, because things such as repo, chain sets, how this works, schemas, associations, Ecto Mute, and a lot of new stuff. Things will start to make more sense. So, Still on the database topic, sometimes, depending on how many access to the database you have uh, or how much data you are dealing with, the database may be a bottleneck sometimes. And in some cases, what it can do is to catch some data to help us. And for this, there, are, there is this feature from Erlang that's called HS tables. And if you look at the documentation, we can see that this provided the ability to store very large quantities of data in an Erlang runtime system and to have con constant access time to the data. So since they stay in memory, they are very fast. And a common use case for ETS is to store cache. However, there are some things that we need to take into consideration when we are choosing this. So, when we talk about cache in memory, Redis usually comes to my mind, at least. So this ETS kind of looks like Redis, and Redis I know how to use, right? So why not use this one There's for free in Erlang already, and I don't need to set up any external environment for Redis or this kind of stuff. So not so fast. <laughs> ETS tables are like hash straight into memory. They don't have many optimization options if you need to compress the data you are dealing with or something like this. And they also consume the memory available for your application. So if your application is doing important work and needs memory, the ETS will use it. So you need to be careful with this. And it doesn't offer support to distribution as well. So with these constraints, is ETS what you really need? Take into account the amount of items you will handle with ETS tables. Because there was this time uh, that we ended up creating an ETS table that had 76 gigabytes of memory consumption. <laughs> and this wasn't critical to the business at all. This could be uh, another, you know, I could use it Redis or within a completely different solution. But what I'm saying really that what I'm saying is that ETS are evil and we should never use this. No, <laughs> I'm saying that you need to consider your options. So this is a cool case. This company has a product similar to Google Analytics and they solved their problems with ETS. They completely dropped the database and they are using an ETS instead. So if we take a closer look at here, the, it's kind of difficult to see, but the compressed data they have, it's 123 gigabytes. And without compressing it, they have 2.5 terabytes without compression. So it is a lot from one application, right? You need to consider if it, this makes sense to your business, go for it. If you don't, uh, take into account uh, another options you may have. Okay, so talking about features of Elixir, there is this feature called Doctest, and documentation, it is a first class citizen in Elixir. And we have this awesome feature that executes our documentation so they don't get outdated. 
And I particularly think documentation is really good because two months from now, I won't remember a thing, what I was doing today. And the way it works is it allows, it allows us to generate tests from the code examples in the documentation we write. So the way it works is by invoking the doc test macro from within our test case. And by doing so, when we run our test, this piece of code uh, will be tested and the docs won't get outdated. But since we are talking about doc tests, uh, can we use doc tests as our applications tests? No, the, ans the answer is you shouldn't because it does not replace your application tests under any circumstance. Doc tests should not consume external resources. And there's no way to mock calls using doc tests. And it can make your API code difficult to use, your twist or your test suite intermittent and this kind of stuff. So your application is talking to the outside world. What now? A very common day-to-day case in our application is relying on APIs in libs. And we don't want our suite to access the outside world because this is bad for testing, can cause intermittent testing, long running tests and all this kind of stuff, right? So how do we do it? How do we mock a, or stub a request? So there are some libs that can help us with that and I'll talk about two of them. The first one I was, I'll talk about, it's Bypass, and it is a lib that simulates an external server. It works to stub the layer closer to the request. So the idea is that you remove the external layer and start to call Bypass instead. Instead of talk to the internet, you talk to Bypass now. This way, you can keep your test protected. So how do we do it? Let's think about an example. Your application is to fetch the Twitter data, and you have a module, Twitter client, that does that. Before the test, what you need to do is set up the server, and then in your test, you set up which scenarios you want to test. So it is a success call, a not found, a forbidden. How should our code behave with each scenario? And you need to tell bypass that. So in your code, you pass the server well URL as a dependency instead of hitting the Twitter API. This way you hit the bypass server instead. But then there comes the questioning. Oh, but are we going to pass the Twitter URL all the time in the code? Yeah, kind of. The idea is to leave the API as a dependency on your code. This way is more explicit what you are doing and you can keep a default value and changing during the tests on. So when should we use bypass? The answer is code that needs to make an HTTP request to know how it will behave. So if the API is down, will your application stop working? If it is a success scenario, how we will handle it? If it's an error and stuff like this, but then uh, we start to think, okay, so will I need to repeat this bypass code every time I test something that uses the Twitter client? And the answer is no. <laughs> we have this other lib that's called mocks and it forces you to implement explicit contracts in your application. So let's imagine we have a timeline module that depends on the Twitter client module and you need a contract that says how Twitter client behaves and this is by design to make your dependencies clear, clearer. <laughs> so you don't need to stub all the Twitter client requests in the timeline tests you're creating. You need to know how the Twitter client will behave. So what you will return when it is a success and what if will return when it's go wrong and you need to handle this response. So there is this post from Jose Valin that can help you and it's a little bit older but it's a good one and go read it. <laughs> okay, so 
How do we test process? Since we are talking about tests, the concurrency in Elixir is one of its strongest characteristics, and a lot of this happens through message exchange between process. So there's this module called GenServer. It's one of the abstractions <laughs> to control state and deal with process. And it's kind of mindset change about the way we deal with state in functional programming. Uh, this is a learning curve too. Um, in object oriented, we are used to have state in objects and we don't have objects in functional programming. So functional programming don't, doesn't eliminate state, we control it. So any application we write, we need to store state in somewhere because it's the code we do changes and we need to, to handle it. So functional paradigm helps you turn the state more explicitly. It imposes you some ceremonies to change and manage the state. So let's use a counter as a, an example to keep it simple. And we will have an increment and a, fitch, and a fetch feature. So the callbacks would be something like this. And for this example, I'm using an ETS table. So I'm creating an update a counter and doing a lookup. Cool, we wrote a gene server. How do I test it now? So I know, let's test. So there's this code on the callbacks from the gene server. I know how this works, I can control. Why not test the callbacks from gene server, right? So to test a gene server callback, it's not a good practice because we are testing implementation rather than behavior. And what does that mean? When we send a message to a process, it can be two things. In the gene server case, it can be a common, our gene server cast, and we don't wait for an answer. What the process does with it is his problem. Your implementation is a privileged detail, and that's why we don't test it. The only thing we can test is that the message was sent. The other thing a message can be, it's a query. In this case, we expect an answer, and what matters is that something came back, not what came back in this case. So the logic of what should be returned based on a message type should be unit tested. So you don't need to check the details from the callback, if the ETA table was created or not, this kind of stuff. What you can test is the API from your gene server, and not the implementation details. By doing so, if your logic change for some reason, your API doesn't and your tests won't break and they are not fragile anymore. So one of the things people ask me is what are the most common problems with functional languages? Does functional uh, resolve all of your problems? So everything I've learned in object-oriented program, I'm going to throw away in functional programming. Uh, how do I organize my code here? Do all the problems I had in OOP disappear in functional programming? So functions solve everything, right? What about this context that Phoenix has? How do I use it? And chances are that the code will be less complex because it will be more explicit, explicit, but the problems still exist. So many of the problems we see in object-oriented, we can see in functional programming as well. Things change, but we don't throw away our knowledge. So things like long functions, functions that are hard to test, simple changes need to be done in many places, feature and context with too many lines, tight coupling, and all this kind of stuff we can see. So there's this awesome talk about Georgina uh, on Elixir Conf 2018. And the idea of this talk is how we can use the solid principles applied in functional programming, right? So we can use the solid principles to organize our code. Uh, things like single responsibility, open close dependency inversion, we can use this kind of stuff. There are some principles that may not be applied 
because there are some kind of inheritance and we don't have this in functional programming. But we can use some of them and this can help us for improvement in code organization. When we are writing code in functional, we still want to minimize the number of modules affected by a change. We still want to have reliable interface contracts. We still want high level policy to be independent of low level details. So these things don't change. And we also can use some concepts of domain driven design to design and organize our code. And there is already books using DDD in functional languages. So we are not alone. We, we can seek for help in some places. And since we are talking about domain driven design and there's this context things, how can we organize our code? So from Phoenix 1.3, we no longer have modules and eh, models. Sorry. <laughs> Some questions can appear, such as, how does it work? Uh, where do I put my code now? And I don't have model, model anymore. I don't have objects. I have schemas, but I don't want to put the domain logic there. And what should be its responsibilities? So contexts are boundaries between your application modules. It is a module with functions to expose public interface of your application. Let's think about an example. We'll work on a new bank project and we'll have a checking account and a credit card feature. So let's create a credit card context since it's one of our domain that we need to solve. And at the beginning, we have simple functions and as the bank gets bigger, they were requirements increase and now we have some more functions and as the time goes by the bank implements new features and such as rewards for credit card, bank statement for the mobile and stuff like this and all of a sudden the content has more functions now, the need to interact with other schemas increase and context gets bigger than they should. So all of a sudden our context may have 3,000 lines of code. And what can we do to prevent this from happening? What we can do is to move orthogonal functionality out of the context. And by this, I mean, basically, you don't need to keep rewards in the credit card context just because they have an intersection at some point. You can move things out. You can create another context to be consumed by the, the credit card, right? So. What you can also do is move queries closer to the schema. You move the queries fragments to the schema, but you still control everything, everything from the context and you would still have the repo at the context to control all the stuff. And this is not, move, this is not me saying to you to move the, dom the domain logic to the schema. I'm saying that by moving uh, fragments closer to the schema, we can keep related information in one place and we can remove minor details from the context and improves readability. Okay, so I think I was kind of fast, <laughs> but I know it was a lot of content to, to talk, uh, but I'll be around if you wanna ask some questions. And thank you.